Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody, uh, to Engineering 443-543. This is our third lecture. As always, I need to remind you that we're being live streamed and made available subsequently. Uh, as I mentioned a bit ago, the recordings are available immediately, but they're not indexed. And so if you go to my YouTube channel and you look uh, for this recording, you will find it, but it doesn't get put in the specific playlist until after it's been cleaned up and edited. So uh, if you're patient and willing to deal with the with the dead air at the beginning and the end and things like that, it's available immediately. You don't have to wait, uh, but we don't post it officially until it's been cleaned up a little bit. And I want to thank uh, Hayden for doing the cleanup for this last week's slide. So this this week I want to really do two things. I want to go back and have opportunity for people to talk a little bit more about projects. If people feel strongly that we can't get through the project ideas uh, on the schedule that I had originally planned, we can delay things a little bit. Again, every year it's a little bit different and I try to adjust my uh, expectations and, and schedule based on what people asked for the year before. But of course that means you're always fighting the previous war. And so just because it was what people wanted last year doesn't necessarily mean it's what we want this year. And so we always are willing to uh, adjust. So please do make yourselves uh, your taste and feelings clear about that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, cell lattices, some of the things that you worked on a little bit with the homework. And uh, then come back to um, playing with cells and we'll see how far we get with that. I'd like, uh, if we have time, uh, to start talking about uh, basic Python steppables and how to do uh, CompuCell coding in Python, uh, and also how to do in, in, in simulation uh, graphics and plots. But we'll see how far we get uh, today. Not that important one way or the other. Uh, we don't do it this week, we'll do it next week. So the first thing I wanted to do was actually take a little bit of time uh, for people to uh, talk about where they were with project ideas. And so to begin with, I'd like uh, people to uh, just take five or 10 minutes to enter your ideas, at least your contact information and your uh, skill set in that teaming document uh, that we have had. A couple of people have done it, but a lot of people still haven't put any material in it. So even if you don't know what you want to do, please do create an entry for yourself, because if we're going to create teams effectively, we have to have that information uh, there. And so I was going to ask people to spend the first five, five or so minutes of class, 10 minutes uh, doing that. Uh, the Google Doc link is here in the uh, in the uh, QR code. So why don't people try that QR code, especially if you're online, try that QR code. Juliano, maybe you could put the, uh, the, the link in the chat as well. And then after people have done that, uh, I think I'd like to go around the room, so to speak, and have everybody talk just for a minute or two about where they are with project ideas. Um, in principle, we're asking people to do a more uh, uh, detailed presentation of an idea or two next week. If people are ready for that, that would be great. If you're not ready, uh, we can delay that by another week or so. Uh, but I want to I want to make sure that we get people teamed up. And again, even if you're feeling is that you don't care what you do, you just want to work on a project, that's fine too. Uh, I'm sure there are people who are looking for teammates uh, that we can connect you to. 
So, so please take five or 10 minutes, uh, enter. If you can't get to that document, please let us know right away because that's critical. Uh, we also created a Slack and I'm not a big Slack user, uh, but one advantage of the Slack is it does allow people to communicate uh, effectively, even if you can't talk. And with a split classroom where audio is not easy with multiple groups, if we were all online, I could do breakout rooms on Zoom. If we were all in person, I could put people in corners of the room. Uh, trying to do breakout in a split session in a split session is a little bit more complicated. And so, if uh, uh, the Slack may be the best way for doing that kind of communication. Uh, for groups that have some people in the room and some people online. And so please check that Slack link out too and make sure that that works for you. So why don't I, uh, I give everybody a few minutes here to, to go into that document and, uh, and let me know uh, what you're thinking about. Can, can I get a sort of a thumbs up from our online people? if you're able to get into that document. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so the link works. How about the Slack? Does that Slack link work? Aiden says it does. If anybody has trouble with it, we have, it's not the most common name in the world. We have two Haydens in the class. Uh, but uh, Hayden Fennell was the one who, who set it up. And so if we have any issues, he's here to help us out with the Slack. And if people have any questions about what to put into that document, anything like that, um, feel free to unmute and ask or or uh, put it in the chat either way. And if you've already filled it out, you can update it or um, add material or or talk to people who've entered other things. So yes, so so as I said earlier, I know some people had Giuliano given some feedback that the homeworks are pretty heavy, especially in conjunction with the uh, with the uh, project assignments. And so this week I'm not going to give you any homework except to work on the projects so that uh, people can catch up. And if you if you didn't get a homework, that was due by the homework one or two that you didn't get in and you needed extra time for it, please just submit it anyway. It's okay. Uh, again, I, I, I try to discourage people from submitting a lot of late homeworks, uh, not so much because I'm worried about people being a week late, but because you don't wanna to get to the end of the semester and have 10 homeworks due at the same time. So, so we have some flexibility here. So please, uh, if you if you uh, are behind on the homework, you can use this week to catch up on that as well. Okay, so I thought we could maybe just run through this very quickly, and uh, and have people speak a word or two about where they are with their thinking, um, so that people could, especially people who say they're interested, could ask any relevant questions to start with. So why don't we start, Logan, you're at the top. All right, so um, Nick and I are working I are together. Work together. On a, oh, Nick and I are working together on a project where we're looking at um, quorum sensing and bacteria. And we're between like kind of two ideas where it's looking at the dr timing of drugs. So my lab works on quorum sensing inhibitors as therapeutics. And so like, kind of, you know, as inspiration, that COVID model we looked at where they timed the um, dosing of remdesivir 
but this time like in the context of spatially organized bacterial populations. And then um, either that or we were also interested in like how cheaters affect bacterial populations and time permitting maybe like a combination of the two because quorum sensing cheaters also impact the ability of therapeutics to be effective. Right. Well, that's, a, as I said, I think earlier, that's a fascinating problem. I mean, the, the place that that's probably been explored the most modeling wise is in the context of tuberculosis. Um, Denise Kirshner has done you know, all these beautiful models of granulomas and the penetration of uh, antibiotics into granulomas and the, the, the interaction with the immune system. Um, and so I think that that's great. And if you and Nick are already working together, that's good. Gabriel, you said you might be interested. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask now about that? That might be useful? Uh, none that I could think of right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, sure. Oh, actually maybe one. Here, wait. Uh, you said you mentioned MATLAB. Are, are you guys coding the project in MATLAB, or are you planning on doing that in CC3D? Um, I so I just know that sometimes MATLAB can be useful for like graphing the results. I think if I understand it right. So I just wanted like it's something that I have like no clue how to use. Um, so that's kind of why I listed that there in case it would be useful. I didn't know whether or not it would actually be useful for the project. I just know it's a weak point for myself. So in case there is a use, I wanted someone who at least kind of knew what they were doing with that. I think, yeah, I think yeah. you'll That's find right. that most, most of the things you want to do analysis with exist as Python libraries, yep. uh, which are more, com more easily compatible with CompuCell. Not that there's anything wrong with doing post-processing of your data with MATLAB, uh, but, but, uh, uh, CompuCell is designed to make it relatively easy to do your data processing on the fly. Yep. So, so we're happy to talk to you as your project develops about that. And I'm very happy that you want to use the remdesivir model as your jumping point since that's mine. Uh, but something that I will point out is that in your case, you're doing bacteria. So, and in my case, the virus was inside of the cells, which wouldn't be true for you, right? So you'd have to have your bacteria be outside the cells and be agents. My virus outside of the cells was a chemical field. So those are big differences that you should keep in mind, but I'm sure I'm happy to be a starting point and happy to help with how, whatever changes you need to do to the model. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be an awesome starting point. And as I say, we can look at some of those, we could look at some of these models of Denise's and see how to, how to whether those are adaptable. Um, okay, Elmar. Mm -hmm. Why don't you come? Yeah, it's probably better come up here and just. Uh, just Hi guys. So um, this is a very simple biological model. So it's an organic model that models is only one cell type, and there is as well the matrix that is another cell type, and maybe the media that kind of is a search agent type more than cell type so uh i think uh, if i can choose the project i would not go too complicated because then in my opinion it's doable and uh i would get like this a uh, lot of insights i think about the basics and then i can always later on go with the more difficult model that's why i would go with such a simple biological model and then the paper has as well suggested a, a continuum model, which, because we have to as well look at the other frameworks, I know that there is tissue, tissue, uh, uh, there was another framework that can do uh, continuum models. So I would as well try to model 
the same problem with this framework. And then I would tackle the same as well with PC cell. So I would have three different modeling frameworks that would model the same. And the interesting thing would then to be to see as well, does one model supersede the other one or do they just show different perspectives? And uh, like this, I, I would understand more about which model framework to choose for what problems. I think that's from the learning point would be an interesting project. Maybe biologically, it's not the most exciting, but but it would give you insight about modeling. Yeah, I'm happy to do myself or with somebody else, or maybe I, I go to another project if really nobody joins. Okay, are there any questions for Elmer? Oh yeah. If not now, if you think of any, you've got the Slack, you've got his email, please. Uh, yeah. please yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Ibrahim. Yeah, so hey everybody. So uh, as I mentioned last week, I was thinking about doing a project where we um, focus on zebrafish embryonic development and expose it to various chemicals. But kind of trying to focus in on that, perhaps we'll pick a certain tissue type or organ system um, that we can mimic the embryonic development of um, through modeling. And then we can expose that to various chemicals um, and see what the, I guess the reaction would be. That's the goal, I guess, of the project. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any ideas or comments. But then I'm not afraid to become too complicated and you get no output. That's what I'm afraid about. It's not short and the thing gets through it and learn. I'm just, I'm, I'm very afraid to get so much stuff and lost in this process. Yeah, it, it does seem quite big and expansive, but um, I believe you mentioned last time that there might be some. Um, people who can help out with uh, zebrafish development. And if we can get a working model for any type of like organ tissue or organ system, um, it could be the most simple one as well with the least amount of unique cell types. If we can get that working, um, the chemical exposure thing should be like the same regardless of what type of organ we get working. Okay, so I have a suggestion then about that. Which is my priority then for you would be to look at models of developmental stages. And they may be in zebrafish, they may be in related organisms. Um, and, and, ask, and, and try to find one that you like. For example, we had a long time ago, we published a paper with, with Maria actually, uh, where we were trying to look at the growth of intersegmental blood vessels in zebrafish. And that project sort of was started. It was supposed to turn into a toxicology project and then it never quite got finished. Uh, that might be a developmental stage that could be interesting because there's been quite a bit of modeling of uh, toxicological perturbations of, of uh, vascular development. Um, we have models of some mite formation in mice and chicken. Uh, Somitogenesis in zebrafish is a little bit different. The, the, the uh, biomolecular signaling is a little simpler in zebrafish than it is in, in, uh, in mammals and in birds. Right, the segmentation of the body. And uh, um, there are models of primitive streak formation in chicks, but, but that's rather different from zebrafish. Um, I think there's some nice published models of uh, neural crest cell migration in zebrafish. Um, and that might be something one could replicate. Those are Paul Kulesa's models. So I would I would say 
trying to model perturbations of zebrafish development generally, Elmer's point about it being too broad is, is a good one. But if you can find a published model of a particular phase of zebrafish development, uh, that's interesting. Uh, and we can start from that and then ask how to perturb it. Then I think it becomes a, a, a practical and interesting problem. Uh, but the key thing would be to pick. You have to be pretty narrow in your in your window. And and I would also tend to pick something that's that's inside the embryo proper. In other words, early phases of zebrafish development where you have a pibboli, where you have the whole movement of the cells over the oak sac. Um, that's beautiful and we're working on it, but that's actually challenging for a variety of reasons in its own. And I wouldn't recommend that. There are too many cells, it's too large an area. But if you go inside the embryo and there are particular cell movements uh, in the tail bud, for example, I know there are people at Purdue working on tail bud wound healing and recovery in the zebrafish. Um, there are people modeling a delta notch patterning uh, in in the embryo. There, there, there are quite a few uh, published models of the, either with conscious cell or with related pack or with packages that do similar things of particular developmental stages in the zebra. Um, and so if you can pick what if you can find one or two of those as possibilities, then I think it becomes a practical problem. And then we can look at some of the toxicology papers and see how they modeled that. Now, there are a lot of toxicology papers using copy cell, uh, developmental toxicology papers, but they mostly focus on, on mouse uh, because of the human, because they're focusing on human uh, human relevance. Uh, but a lot of that will generalize to do Not all of it, but a lot. So I think I think the key thing there is to try to pick a find one or two possibilities. I'm happy to meet with you and, and look do some digging and see what we can find. Sounds good. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Ibrahim while while we have him available? Feel free to speak up if you have a Question or comment? Okay, Gabriel, you're next. Yeah, so I'm in between two ideas uh, that I was talking about with you previously, but very briefly. Um, so I come from cognitive science, so my backgrounds, I, I have a, a, most of my modeling experiences in evolutionary robotics. Um, but I was also in the previous version of this class last semester. So I did some stuff with tissue homeostasis and trying to map out different cellular topologies. We, we replicated a, um, a previous model of how they kind of, you know, are robust to lesions and all that kind of stuff. So I'm basically, I'm kind of in between the two right now. Um, I'm, I would also be persuaded to like, you know, do something <laughs> different, but yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. There's not much, too much to say. I'm leaning more towards uh, the olfactory epithelium project just because it seems, but I'm also currently just trying to get some basic stuff done um, on the other one. So I'm kind of working on both of them at the same time. So that, which is chaotic, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Any comments or questions for Gabriel? So, so that that since the audio may not be working so well for people, let me repeat the question. So, so Elmer asked. Uh, for people who don't know about robotics and evolution, could you possibly put a link to one or two core papers in this document that could give them an orientation to that kind of question? 
Yeah. Yeah. I could do that. I could try and find some stuff and, and put like a couple of papers in it's uh, yeah. Okay. He says one is plenty. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes, you know, the, it's easier to find three than one. Yeah, okay, but, but, uh, for. <laughs> okay. Yeah, for a topic like that, sometimes like one <laughs> one paper might just be a specific, thing, but but yeah, I'll try to find. I think there's got to be like some sort of review or something that's pretty good. I think I'll find something. Perfect, perfect. Okay, Jonathan, it looks like you are are open to working with other people. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't really have a, a set project idea. Also, I apologize in advance uh, if my camera cuts out uh, at any point. Uh, I, I dropped the laptop one too many times and I've been having a tough time since. But I, I have uh, some experience with uh, I have a general bio background in terms of uh, classes and coursework. I've completed a modeling and simulation course. I have Python background, MATLAB background. Uh, I'm very interested in doing uh, something involving the brain. Now, what that looks like, I'm not totally sure, uh, but I was also interested in one of the papers um, talking about cell differentiation. I don't remember too many of the details. It's been a, it's been a week since I looked at it, but it's it stuck out as interesting to me. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm open to working with anybody and uh, can fit in wherever needed. Great. Well, I think I think that's uh, people. People are looking for teammates, so you should meet with people, and you know maybe you can help push a project in a way that you find interesting and that complements your your expertise. That's great. Okay, uh, Aiden. It sounds like you also are open to working with multiple people. Is that right? Yeah, I my idea is and fully formed i still need to do some thinking about it okay i know you you had talked about bone morphogenesis that's a it's a great project but but again you know you, it may be that you can even if you're not working directly on the thing that you're most interested in you can learn enough about methods and about biology that it's useful even if it's not a perfect a perfect match so thank you so okay uh jh Hello. Um, yeah, I, I basically uh, initially thought about uh, inflammation in Alzheimer's disease, but I confirmed with the author that she cannot provide the code. So I shifted to the more stem cell oriented projects. Uh, I, I'm still yeah debating like um, I am more interested in the human pluripotent stem cells, uh, mm -hmm. which differentiate into brain, uh, not just brain, but organoid tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, but with, yeah, I, which is scaring me away is a paper really looks good, but they said they use not only Morpheus, but also machine learning. So I don't know if it is uh, uh, possible, feasible to implement, to replicate that. So. I, uh, that's why I uh, entered a second project as well, uh, which is about the intestinal stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a chapter in the stem, computational stem cell textbook and uh, it, they demonstrated uh, how to use CompuCell to demonstrate that. So I think uh, it's easier to follow yeah. up. So yeah, I'm debating. Well, that I mean, since since Elmer also wants to model organoid culture, maybe the two of you could talk together and see whether putting your heads together, you could find a, an interesting organoid culture problem that you could both like. I don't want I don't want to force you to do that, but I thought it's at least possible that 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 might work. I'm actually interested in I think the idea was that there was a published Morpheus model that you could re-implement in Compass. Uh, it's a little easier to go from Morpheus to Compass cell than from physicist cell to Compass cell because they have the same cell representation. 
Great. Okay. Any other questions for JH? All right. Uh, Carmen. Um, so I haven't like really decided on like what direction I want to go in, in terms of the project, but, um, there's a couple of the cancer therapy papers I was more interested in, but I'm good with anything more like biology, anatomy focused and like modeling. Okay. So, and I, I'd encourage you to sort of circulate and see, maybe you can push the project in a cancer direction. I, I know Elmer's got some cancer interests, um, and the, the, the goal here, I know self-organization like this is painful, but uh, I really prefer people to come to their own, you know, to their own, uh, find your own way rather than to force you to force you into something. Uh, Mike. Yeah, maybe if you're not, if you're not on the Wi-Fi. Uh, just, just come up if you do. Um, okay, yeah. So I didn't really have a set idea. Um, I was originally thinking about like modeling a slime mold or like bacteria uh, growth of some sort, um, and so that was kind of the idea I was on there. Um, I, I did post some articles that I found interesting from the last last assignment, and so if anyone wants to like look through those, um, that's kind of they're mostly morphogenesis related. So I was kind of also interested in anything there. Um, so yeah, those those are cool. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much all I had. Okay, great. So it's good. I mean, some people have strong ideas. Some people are flexible. I hope that that means we can make some nice teams. Uh, Nick, you're already committed. You're already working, right? You've already got some things uh, organized. Yeah, me and Logan have been talking a little bit. I was definitely swayed by his project idea with the quorum sensing. I was um, really interested in the idea of bacterial communication. I, I was unaware that was even a, a thing. But um, my experience was kind of what he was looking for, modeling in Python, and definitely um, most of my experience is in like machine learning areas. So if we wanted to add something like that, I would definitely be interested. But that and um, right. maybe talking about the the gap between simulation and and actual treatment, but uh, only if it's applicable, of course. I know, I mean, Gabriel was talking about sort of trying to do a machine learning control system for the quorum sensing. Uh, and actually I have a student who's not, who's doing an independent study using CompuCell rather than in this class, uh, who's, who's working on a project like that as well this semester. So, so great. I think, I hope, is, did I miss anybody? Is there anybody who was, uh, who was here that didn't get to speak? I think that should be everybody. But. I want to make sure I didn't miss anyone. Sounds like it sounds like that there we're beginning to coalesce on a couple of ideas, and I think uh, please take your time. Now, if you're ready to present something next week, uh, that's okay. If not, we can certainly delay things for another week. But I do want I think it's important to spend your time this week focusing on on trying to develop these ideas. I think they're great material here. I think. Uh, if we had three or four projects coming out of the class that were, were effective, that would be really good. Um, so are there any, any questions or comments before we go on at this point? No? All right. All right, thank you for your patience. So just reviewing last time, uh, we talked about using Jupyter Notebooks to upload and download files. That's not the most convenient thing in the world, but I hope that you using online version of CompuCell that it gets easier as you do it. Um, the key thing is you typically use Jupyter Notebook to do the upload and the download. 
and CompuCell is designed so that it can zip uh, its file specifications into a single file for easy single file uploading and downloading. Something that we talked about a little bit, and I want to come back to because it, it came up in, in people's homeworks and questions for this week. And, and uh, I skipped over it last week a little bit rapidly. And I, when I, we were talking to people about homework, we realized that perhaps we should spend a little more time on it, which is that CompuCell simulations that also was in Morpheus and actually uh, parts of business cell simulations as well, are, are lattice based. And so you have a, a, domain, a spatial domain that you have to define a universe in which your cells are going to live. And that in computer cells called the cell lattice. And computer cell allows you to use either a square lattice or a hexagonal lattice. Um, with a variety of, of adjustable range of uh, interactions and potentially with periodic boundary conditions. And that is defined at the top of a computer simulation um, in the CompuCell POTS section, where you give the dimension of the lattice. Here I've defined a 3D lattice, it's 100 by 100 by 100. You can define various directions as periodic, if you like. Uh, you can define an intrinsic neighbor range three, and we'll find that that neighbor order or interaction range will come up multiple times and may not be set consistently between different uh, elements of the code for a variety of reasons. Uh, and you can also uh, define a hexagonal array uh, if you want, which uh, has its own tag. And we talked a little bit about what cells, how cells are represented in CompuCell cell as a cluster of voxels in that cell lattice, which share an index, usually denoted sigma. Uh, so all voxels uh, with index sigma are part of cell sigma. They don't have to be connected. Um, and every cell by default has a type, which is usually called POW. And it's important to note that the surface of a cell, in, in reality, cells have membranes which are physical objects. In CompuCell, the surface of a cell is just where that cell touches a cell of a different identity, uh, and it doesn't have any material identity. And that, that actually becomes a little bit of a problem sometimes uh, when you work with CompuCell. We can get around that, but it, it, it takes some work. And the other thing that we talked about last time was that cells' behaviors and interactions are represented by effective energies and forces. And we'll come back to those uh, in more detail later. The ones that we're going to use again and again are going to be contact energies, the adhesion or repulsion between cells. Uh, the fact that cells have uh, a roughly defined volume, which is given by a volume constraint, they often will have. Uh, a surface constraint, a roughly targeted surface area. Um, and then the way the kinetics work, and we'll talk about that again, where the cells have this concept of uh, membrane fluctuations that are actively driven. And that fluctuation amplitude, which we'll keep coming back to. We have to remember that almost nothing exists in computer cell models unless you explicitly create it. If we don't say there's a cell lattice, there's no lattice. If there are no cell types, there are no cell types. And so sometimes we'll write a simulation and it will do something that we don't expect. And it'll be because we're assuming that you got something for free when it wasn't asserted. And so you do have to be careful sometimes that things that uh, things that uh, you might expect to happen naturally because they happen in the real world in a particular way, aren't implemented in CompuCell automatically. Again, the key things that we're going to have for ourselves are going to be defined in terms of effective energies. 
And uh, one of the homework problems was beginning to dig in by hand. It may have been a little bit tedious to do those exercises for homework three, uh, the homework um, that was due today, uh, doing some hand evaluation of some effective energy terms. Um, in particular, again, cell volume, surface area, uh, some basic control of cell shape can be built into Compure Cell. Adhesion and repulsion between cells is very important. Uh, we can also apply directed movement to cells. We can apply forces to cells. Uh, that could be in response to chemical fields in the environment, to gravity, uh, or to uh, intrinsic uh, motor behavior of the cells. And CompuCell naively adds all of these things up. And from a physicist's point of view, we're used to saying that the net force on an object is the sum of all of the different forces acting on it. Effectively, we're doing the same thing, except we're using this, uh, what's called a first integral formalism, or effective energy formalism. So coming back because of the homework uh, and some of the questions I was getting, I wanna go over this ideas a little bit more detail today. Um, one of the things that, is a little bit complicated in CompuCell if one wants to really understand it in detail. A lot of times you can get away with ignoring it, but sometimes it comes back and bites you if you don't think about it, uh, is the fact that the cell lattice uh, could be two-dimensional or three-dimensional. It could be square or hexagonal. Uh, it could be nearest neighbor, second neighbor, third neighbor. And we do need to think a little bit about what being on a lattice does to our computations. And so let's consider a single cell. Uh, we'll say it has some index sigma, and we're gonna make in red all of the voxels in our lattice that are uh, composed of cell sigma. And so here we're assuming we're in a 2D simulation. And one of the things that you, you find in, in a lattice is that the Pythagorean theorem, otherwise known as Euclidean distance, doesn't quite work. And so distances don't uh, behave according to the Manhattan metric rather than the uh, more common uh, Euclidean metrics. And that has some somewhat unexpected properties, especially when your cells are small compared to the lattice size. And you'll find that things happen like cells line up along lattice directions uh, boundaries of cells line up along lattice direction, cells can get stuck. There's effectively a friction against the lattice. Um, there's actually, there's actually, uh, I was going to say taxi cab geometry. There was, a, I think, a mathematical games column many years ago in Scientific American that had a nice exploration of uh, some of the counterintuitive things about the so called Manhattan metric. So I want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, I don't usually dig into CompuCell details um, that uh, so much early in the class, but again, because of the homework, I thought that it would be nice to review this. People worked on it a little bit, so maybe it'll be more meaningful. So one of the things that we've seen is that there is this neighbor order and we'll find neighbor order comes up a couple of times uh, in some of our plugins. And so on a lattice, we have to define what it means for two things to be next to each other. That's not an automatic concept. And so if I pick a voxel and I ask what other voxels are next to it, uh, that's typically given by a neighbor range or a neighbor order and a neighbor list. And so let's start out by labeling one voxel uh, as our initial voxel. Let's just say this is our starting voxel. And now I'm going to look at its nearest neighbors. And for neighbor uh, order, neighbor range of one, or what's called the nearest neighbor uh, relationship, on a square lattice, those are four nearest neighbors, left, right, up, and down. The diagonals are not included in nearest neighbors. 
Let's say I have four nearest neighbor voxels. If I were in 3D, I would have six because I'd go up and down as well. If I go to range two, I get the corners of my square. Those are my next nearest neighbors. So I have four more neighbors. And if I want to be contiguous, just touching, then that's as far as I can go. Uh, there aren't any more voxels that are adjacent to my zero that aren't, aren't included there. Um, and you could say, well, why would I go to longer distances? And the answer is that when you see your cell edges lining up along the lattice directions, that's happening because of what's called lattice anisotropy. A line on a diagonal has a different length from a line in the vertical horizontal direction because of the uh, square nature of the lattice. And when you go to longer interaction ranges, you smooth that out. And so longer interaction ranges are a little bit less likely to pin on the lattice. You have fewer lattices. If I go to third neighbor, I add uh, the voxels to the left, to the right, to the up and to the down one level further away. And so now I have four nearest neighbors, eight out to neighbor order two, and now 12 to neighbor order three. And if I go to fourth neighbor, I add eight. And you can see this is getting rounder. Finally, at four, you're getting rounder. And very often we'll use fourth neighbor interactions uh, when we run with CompuSol. As we make the neighbor order longer, CompuSol will run a little bit slower. There's always a trade-off between these two things. But this is something that, that uh, takes a little bit of getting used to, and I want to go over that with you together here. Um, if I go in 3D, I have to go up and down. As I mentioned, nearest neighbor in 3D is pretty straightforward. Left, right, up, down top, bottom. If I go to second neighbor, I add, think about a cube, a three by three Rubik's cube minus the three corners. I mean, the, sorry, minus the eight corners. And then I'd add the corners at the next step and keep going out. Uh, hexagonal lattices are a little bit more complicated to think about, but actually they're not that hard to implement computationally. Somewhat surprisingly, given that there's no native uh, data structure to correspond to lattices of this type, it winds up that if I imagine a square lattice and I jiggle each row back and forth a little bit, that gives me a hexagonal lattice. And so on the right, I've drawn a hexagonal lattice in two dimensions. And I've drawn in red a line, a horizontal line going through a row of cells, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And I've drawn vertically a zigzag line going between 27, 21, 15, 9, and 3. And if I move my rows one, 13 and 25 a little bit to the right, I find that that corresponds to a nice or square array as shown here on the left. And so I can use just a regular 2D array to represent a two-dimensional hexagonal grid. What I have to worry about is that in 2D, I have four nearest neighbors for each cell in a square lattice. In 2D and a hexagonal lattice, each site has six neighbors. And so I have to add two additional neighbor identities, which here are drawn in green. So in the square lattice, site number 14 is next to 13, 20, 15, and eight. In the hex lattice, it is also next to 19 and seven. 
And so I have to add those two neighborhoods. All of the cells in that row with the red line in it add two additional links up and left, down and left. If I go to the next row, the one that begins seven, they also have six links, but instead of you, and I have my normal four up, down, left, right. But in addition, I add up, right, and down, right. And so now my adjacency depends on whether I'm in an even row or an odd row. And so my neighbor's list now alternates depending on whether I'm in an even row or my odd row of my grid. But that's all I need to do to go from square to hexagonal array. So that's very convenient. Um, I think that I do have, yes, go ahead. Sorry about that, but uh, could you go back to previous slide? Uh, yep. think, uh, could you use your uh, mouse pointer? Uh, sorry, but I'm not following. Uh, yeah. So. Okay, so here is, here is the position in my lattice, 14. Can you see 14? Yes. Okay, maybe I can use the uh, spotlight. Is that easier to see? Does that, yes, does that dot work better? Okay, so here's 14. On a square lattice, 14's nearest neighbors are 13, 20, 15, and 8. In a hexagonal lattice, 14 is also next to 13, 20, 15, and 8. But in addition, it's next to 19 and 7, which are upper left, sorry, upper left and lower left, which are next nearest neighbors in the square lattice. So the hexagonal lattice is pulling in two extra neighbors for my location. Each one of my lattice points has six nearest neighbors in the hex lattice. If I'm representing the hex lattice on a square lattice, which is how the computer thinks about these things, I have to say that my adjacency matrix now is instead of the up, down, left, right, it's up, down, left, right, upper, left, and lower left. The thing that makes it just a little bit more complicated is that if I'm in an even row, like this one that has the red line in it, I include upper left and lower left as extras, those two. If I'm in the row below it that begins with a seven, instead of upper left and lower left, I include upper right and lower right. And so my adjacency pattern goes left in one row, the row below it, right, Left in the next row, the low row below it, right. Oh, what, what, what is the role of the red line or the blue line? That's just to show you that the red line doesn't change. In other words, if I draw a horizontal line in, in, a two, in a square lattice, it stays a straight line in the hexagonal lattice. But if I draw a vertical line in the square lattice, it becomes a zigzag in the hexagonal lattice. Gotcha. Uh, in general, these are technical details you don't have to worry about too much. CompuCell will take care of it automatically. But if I want to know, for example, how to convert the volume of a voxel to real volume, or the distance in a CompuCell lattice to a real distance, then you'll have slightly different scaling factors when you go for a square and hexagonal lattice. Yeah. Yes. So what is the same thing for hexagonal lattice? So, so Elmer asks, it, 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 I mentioned that things aren't quite the same in continuous 
Euclidean space to non-a lattice. And he says, is the same thing true in the hexagonal lattice? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> hexagonal lattices are actually a little better behaved than square lattices. Computers for, don't like them as, I mean, they're not, they're that complicated to implement, but they're not the natural structure. The natural structure in a computer is a, is an array, which is a, a square or a cubic lattice. Um, so you have to do a little bit of work to make it smoother. And this particular a hexagonal approximation is one way to do that. A second neighbor hexagonal lattice is very well behaved uh, computation. So, so he, Elmer makes the comment that biologically hexagons are more real than squares. Well, again, here the, the 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 voxels are not really representing, they're just representing little volumes of space. And so it's up to us to decide how we define our space. Um, when we use graph paper, typically we use square, square graph paper. But in the old days, when people really used graph paper, you could in fact buy hexagonal graph paper uh, for, the, for a special purpose. Uh, uh, it has some inconveniences. Measuring distances on hexagonal graph paper is a pain, just for example, but uh, it's possible. I, I'm I think that it's interesting to not, I, I cannot promise that everything in CompuCell works on three-dimensional hexagonal lattice. Uh, doing hexagonal lattices in 3D is actually relatively complicated computationally. 2D is easy, 3D gets a little bit complicated. And so we try to implement everything in both, but it's not all, I can't, it, you may run into bugs because nobody ever tried method X in, in fifth neighbor hexagonal lattice. Uh, Well, again, we're not really representing, I mean, these, this is just, this isn't representing the reality of the structure, but, but it is true that you can get smoother outlines in a hexagonal array than in a square array. I mean, a square array, everything is 90 degree angles, so 45 degree angles. Hexagonal array is a little bit, it gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility. And so, so I definitely would encourage you, um, there may even have been a homework problem or two, probably ones that are not going to get assigned because we're, we're cutting the homework for this week, uh, where I ask you to compare the results of square and hexagonal calculations. Uh, but for our purposes, we typically work with, hexa with square arrays. And uh, if you're interested in hexagonal arrays, uh, Machek wrote a nice, a uh, document called hexagonalattice.pdf <laughs> where you can read all the gory details about how to implement them in 3D. <laughs> but you're certainly not responsible for that within the class. If you're interested, by all means. What are the reasoning, like what, why would you prefer to use the hexagonal lattice over a square lattice? Or is it just mostly dependent, like situation dependent? So the, the main reason that you want to use the hexagonal lattice rather than a square lattice is that when we when we run simulations and we see lattice, cell cell boundaries line up with the lattice, the, the, the lattice doesn't exist in the real biology. There is no lattice. And so if cells are lining up vertically or horizontally, because of the lattice, that's an artifact of our calculation method rather than something that represents what's happening in the real world. And hexagonal lattices, we can get, we can overcome that for square lattices, and it can happen in hexagonal lattices, but it's less likely to happen in hex lattices. So in general, hex lattices are a little bit better behaved. The downside is that calculating distances is hard in hexagonal lattices. 
So there's no free lunch, I'm afraid. Uh, but but it's easy enough to check things. Uh, if you it takes one one tag, which is hexagonal, uh, at the beginning of your code to switch from square to hex, and you can see what it does. Most things don't change. Uh, contact energy and surface area do change when you make that. So you have to adjust them to get things to be the same. And that's something I wanted to go over now. So let's talk about volume. I asked you to do some calculations of volume and surface area in the homework. Um, and and that, that, that could be perhaps better discussed if, if, if you've been if you if you're a physicist by training and you've worked with lattices a lot, like Ising model, then these are things that are sort of second nature to you. But if you're coming from biology or computing, these kind of calculations may be unfamiliar. And I want to go over them. Uh, uh, some of this will be very elementary, in which case it's a review. Uh, if it's if it's unfamiliar and it's too fast, just tell me and we'll slow down. So let's consider our cell again. Volume, in a sense, in CompuCell is a very simple concept. I count the number of voxels. And it returns the number of uh, the, the volume of the cell is its number of voxels. And that is independent of the kinds of cell lattice I'm using. Now, how I convert those voxels into, into real-world units will depend on the lattice. Uh, hexagonal square cells have different volume for the given side length than square cells. From square cells, just if I'm in 2D, volume is really an area. Uh, if I'm in 3D, uh, then I have actual volume. But let's just think about the volume of this red cell. Well, I've labeled voxel 1. Here's voxel Voxel 2, voxel 3, voxel 4, voxel 5, voxel 6, voxel 7, voxel 8, 9, 10, 11. And I'm not going to number all of them by hand here. Uh, but that count is independent. If I go to a hex lattice, it changes my adjacencies, but it doesn't change my identity of which cells are red. Uh, if I go from 2D to 3D, it doesn't change which cells are red. And so nothing changes. And so I'm almost embarrassed to call this an exercise, but what is the volume of the red cell here? Now, uh, Elmer immediately said 21. Uh, somebody? Twenty one. Okay. Okay, we can all count. I don't know, at this time of day, maybe I can't count anymore, but anyway. Okay. So, so that was about half of that one. Of those two of those homework problems were about that level of, of that was about what you had to do. So, good. Okay, now surface area is a little bit more complicated in concrete cell. So what we do is we iterate over all voxels in our cell and we look at our nearest neighbors in some versions of this kind of code, not CompuCell, but for example, Morpheus, you can change the range over which you do this. And we'll come back to that in the middle in a minute. Uh, and we count how many neighbors are not in the same cell. So in this case, I start here. I start here where my zero is. And my nearest neighbors are here in blue, one and one. So I add two units of surface connected to that cell, that voxel. I pick this voxel down here that I've labeled zero in the second one, it only has one nearest neighbor that's different, so it adds one unit of surface. I pick this voxel at the bottom right, it has three neighbors that are not the same type, 
And so that same cell, sorry, I keep this a dot type of cell. And so it adds three units of surface. In 2D, area and volume are a little bit complicated because when we change dimensionality, there isn't a good word we can carry with us between them. Volume is not, is not so ambiguous. Really, when we're talking about surface area in 2D, we really mean perimeter. But since our basic concepts are 3D, we use the 3D name, even though we're in 2D. Okay. And it, the, do, oh, I'm sorry, but do neighbors ever get double counted for the perimeter? So like yeah, for an example, the one they do. they do, yeah. So that's, a, okay, that's what I was wondering when I was doing the homework is I wonder, so does it work as it, it sums all of the neighbors for each of the pixels that surround the, okay. So, so another way to think about this is if I ask how many faces are there on this if I take my red thing and think about cutting it out, and I ask what is the boundary length of it, or how many faces does it have, that's what I'm counting. Now you can have some slightly strange things happen if you have holes, for example, in an object. But in general, if I think about the number of edges, if I think about the number of edges that I have here, 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 count those. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So let's do that as an exercise. What is the surface area of this red cell? Elmer immediately says 25. I'll give people a minute. Everybody type in the chat what you what you come up with as a, a surface area. Somebody says 25, 26. Yeah, it's easy to get lost, isn't it? Yeah. 26 question mark. That's a good one. <laughs> And if somebody says 25, I keep forgetting where I got started. Yep, okay. We have a Heisenberg uncertainty, a Schrodinger's cat here for the surface area of the cell. Okay, anybody else want to vote? I could have had a I could have had a quiz where I had you had how many, how, what's the surface area? 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. I could have had a multiple choice of 26. Okay, but I think the key thing here is to get the idea of going around the edge and counting. And so here I've labeled all of those edge voxels and uh, edges in green. In 3D, it would be faces rather than edges, but the idea is the same. If I were on a hex lattice, it would still be edges in 2D. In 3D, the faces are, sorry, are, are rhombuses. They're actually uh, uh, squashed, uh, squashed par, uh, squares rather than. Uh, and so they're. A honeycomb? Right. So in 3D, the equivalent of a hexagonal lattice in 3D is called hexagonal close packed. And when and that gives you uh, uh, rhom rhombic uh, dodecahedra as your shapes. It winds up that that the a regular polyhedra fills space in 2D fine, 
in 3D cubes do, but but the, 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 that the equivalent of hexagonal is, is a little more complicated. Okay, I hope that gives you some ideas about that. And we'll come back to those homework problems in a minute. Um, now that we've got a way of measuring the actual volume and surface area, now that these effective energies make more sense, I hope. So now we'll say that, that there's an energy of compression associated with the volume, which is every cell has a, a, its actual volume, whatever it is. It has a target volume, the volume that it, it would have if there were no forces acting on it, um, and then inverse compressibility lambda. And so if the actual volume is bigger than the target volume, this energy creates a force that tends to push on the cell to shrink it. If the actual volume is less than the target volume, it creates a pressure that tends to make the cell grow. And so actually the, the, the presence of a volume term uh, in the effective energy is equivalent to saying there's a pressure on the cell that tries to force the cell to have its target volume. The surface area similarly, if the cell actual surface area is bigger than its target, there'll be a tension that will tend to eliminate surface. If the cell is smaller than its target, surface area is smaller than its target, there'll be a extensional force that will tend to increase the surface area of the cell. Lambda surface here is again the inverse of the compressibility of the, of the of the membrane. And so there is a pressure which has this funny form of minus two lambda cell times the difference between the actual and target volume. And there's a surface tension, which is minus two lambda surface times the difference between the actual surface and the target surface. Yeah, Elmer. So that's where our dynamics come from. That's where our dynamics come. So let me just make the comment first that again, uh, the dynamics that we define try to solve all constraints simultaneously. And we can't usually optimize them all at once. So the actual dynamics will be a compromise between those. And if we make those lambdas very large, then those things are going to be very important. And if we make them smaller, they'll be less important. And there's this general idea of a force on an object from a constraint, which has that form that we saw before, minus two lambda uh, for whatever it is that we're trying to optimize times the current value minus the target value. What's nice about and sort of magical about our methodology here, which is very different from what happens when you do deterministic finite element solvers for solids, is that we don't have to tell the system how to find a way of getting to the optimum. It finds it automatically. And it finds it automatically the same way that neural networks find things during uh, learning, which is it tries things randomly. And if it gets you closer to what you're trying for, you keep it. And if it puts you farther away, you generally don't keep it. But if you never take things that make things worse, you get stuck. And so you accept some bad choice. Yes. So Elmer points out that you can get trapped in local minima. And that's certainly true. If you have no fluctuations, if you never allow unfavorable move, then you move to your nearest local minimum of your energy and you stay there. If you have uh, fluctuations, then you're always going to find the global minimum, but it may take a very, very, very long time. And in optimization, this is called simulated annealing as the, as the methodology. 
Uh, what is important is that you have to have the variation of each constraint term roughly of the same order of magnitude uh, if you want this to work. Okay. So let's look at how we specify this in CompuCell uh, in the markup language. The first thing we have to do is list the number types of cells we have. We only have one kind of cell, we'll have, uh, mes say, mesenchyme here. Uh, we always have a cell called medium, which is where we don't have anything going on. It's always there. So that's something we do get for free. The background, nothing we get for free. Um, and when we specify target volume, there's a plugin called volume. Uh, we say for each cell type that it has some inverse compressibility, lambda volume, and some target volume associated with it. That's great if all of our cells are going to be of type mesenchyme are going to be the same. Uh, if we want the cells to actually change, uh, so some of them grow, some of them shrink, but we don't want all cells of the same type to have the same target volume uh, or compressibility, then we have to do things in Python. Similarly, for surface area, um, we can specify lambda surface times actual surface volume minus target surface, sorry, surface volume, surface area times minus target surface. <clears throat> And that translates directly into the XML that we see here. So in our homework, uh, we first assumed that the only energy in the system was the volume. Uh, we said that the target volume was 25, lambda volume was two. And I said, what was the effective energy of the image? So does anybody have their answer from before? on that. How do we solve that? Well, we count how many red voxels we have. And I think we decided the answer is 26. So that means the actual volume is 26. The target volume is 25. 26 minus 25 is 1. 1 times 2 is 2. So that means that the effective energy of this image is two. You could certainly say two what? But... Okay. Yes. Elmer says it's really a difference that matters rather than the exact value. And that's certainly true. Ratios and differences matter. So the second question was, what is a single voxel change to the lattice configuration that would reduce the volume energy? Does anybody have an answer for that? If I make the volume, the actual volume at the moment is 26 and the target is 25. So if I make the volume bigger, am I getting closer to my target or further away? Right. So if I get rid of one red square and turn it to white, my volume goes to 25, in which case my energy goes to zero, which is the smallest it can be. So so if I get rid of one red square, any red square, that reduces the energy by one, by two. Oh, did I miscount? Sorry. I thought we said it was 26. Um, I think the surface area was 26 and the volume was 21 for this picture. OK, thank you. Somebody please speak up. You know, if I say something ridiculous, you need to speak up. <laughs> okay, so if it's twenty-one, then what? Then then what is the effective energy? Twenty-one minus twenty-one minus twenty-five is four. Four squared is sixteen times two is thirty-two. 
Good. So then, yes. So then adding one red voxel anywhere would reduce my energy. Going from 21 to 22, 22 minus 25 is three, three squared is nine is 18. So my energy would go from 32 to 18. Thank you. What would be a lattice configuration that had zero volume constraint energy? Well, any, any configuration that had exactly 25 red squares would be correct. If the target volume were 15 instead of 25, now 21 is bigger than 15. And so now I'll be what I was saying earlier, which is I'll reduce the energy by eliminating red rather than adding. But notice in this case, I'm not saying where to add the red. I could add it anywhere. Discontiguously anywhere in the system, adding it would do the same thing. And so that's certainly not by itself going to tell you that your cell should be compact. Contiguous. It's just going to say there's a certain amount of material, but not where to put it. Okay. So now I said, let's think about a surface constraint. And let's say that the target surface is 13 and lambda surface is 3. And we'll assume we're only doing nearest neighbor interactions. We've already and and here unfortunately I've changed the 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 picture, so we have to count the number of the volume and the surface. So does somebody want to tell me what the surface is? The the volume is here. Hi Dan, but can I also ask a question with it? Sure. Okay, I'll, do you mind if I uh, share my screen and it'll make it easier to ask the question? Awesome. Uh, I'm just going to share my homework. Nobody steal my answers, please. Um, so this is what I have. First, I'm going to ask my question, though, is so for it's more about it's just about second neighbor uh, interaction. So with the only difference between first and second neighbor means that instead of just counting the, the sides like here, you're also counting the diagonal, right? Yes. So you're not only counting the faces, but you're counting the the, the edges basically yeah. right yeah all right cool um and so it works as a sum so in this but there's lots of overlap with second neighbor interactions so are all of those do all of those get counted yes oh okay so then so then here wait i'm just gonna uh i'm gonna scroll to because one of the problems so is this, so do all of these second, because this one is both a neighbor to this square and this square, right? So it's, yes. so in a second neighbor, and if you have just a, a, a five by five rectangle, a second, it, the energy would really be this big. I don't know, maybe I'm. This is second neighbor for, for, uh, for square, for, let's see. So, so corners give you, I actually was going to go over this later. So I actually have slides covering this and it, it, it will come a little <laughs> bit later. So Sorry. let's do it anyway. No, that's fine. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Um, I can't annotate. I have, you have to give me permission to annotate. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Or how do you have I do three that? Three dots at the bottom of your, of your, three dots at the bottom of your zoom control where it says more. Oh, well, you're on a map, yes. so it may or may not work. Uh, uh, your Zoom controls may should have a, oh, a, an option. Here, wait, I got it. It says enable annotation by other. I did it. Okay, um, okay so yeah, let's do this together. So let's just start with this guy here. Here's one cell. Of oxal. And let's do next. Nearest neighbor is one, two. Next nearest neighbor, three, four, five. Now I'm going to go to another, another voxel. Go to this one, green. Nearest neighbor is 
one. So that's being double counted. Yeah. So the next nearest neighbor, two, three. So that one is also being double counted. So yes. So there's a lot of double counting when you go to second mode. Oh, okay. All right. I got you. So, oh, okay. Yeah, then I was confused. Uh, all right. Interesting. So then in the first one, would it be here? Wait, wait. So then in this one, then even with first order, we're not just counting the perimeter. We're also, because this one would then get double counted, right? Right, but it has two edges next to it, so it should be double counted. Okay, yes. Okay. The All right. That's why the <laughs> perimeter, that's why you can use the perimeter, because for nearest neighbor, the perimeter does the double counting you need. Got you. All right. All right, I get it now. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And this is this is why I wanted to go over this, because this really is it 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 seems. What's the what's the perimeter of a, of a, of a, of, a, of a polygon on a piece of paper? Well, it seems trivial, but in fact, it's not obvious how to calculate it. So I'm really glad that you're going over this. Asking us to go over this because I think it's it's not a trivial it's not a trivial thing uh, to to understand. It really is worth uh, it's worth uh, spending a little time on. So thank you very much. Okay. So, all right. Also, wait, I never fulfilled my end of the bargain. So wait, <laughs> so, so then the surface for this shape then would be 28, right? Okay. If we're doing first neighbor interactions. And then okay. the, since the, the target surface is 13, then we would do 28 minus 13 squared times three which is yep. 675 yep. and then plus the volume, the volume of this particular one is 20 minus the target, which is 15 square that times by three is 75. And the total, since it's just a sum as well, is just a 675 plus 75, right? Wow, well, right, perfect. I think, well, I, I, let's see if I got the same number. Uh, I somehow, 675 and 75 I had, so 750 was my total. But I could have counted wrong, so I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm right here. <laughs> I got that. Uh, okay. And so in this case, since both the surface area and the volume are big, are, are, are too big, we can reduce the energy by turning one of the red into a white. But we could certainly create a situation in which one of the red, I mean, that the, the, the surface area was too big and the volume was too small, in which case adding a red might make the volume energy go down and the surface energy go up, or vice versa. So you can have competing interests. And, So the other question was, what's the possible configuration that would minimize the total effective energy? And is the total effective energy zero in this case? Well, in, in the Euclidean world, if I want to have a volume contained with minimal surface, in 2D, I draw a circle. A circle has the smallest perimeter per unit of volume. And 3D, a sphere has the smallest perimeter surface area for a unit of volume. Uh, on a lattice, it winds up, it's quite a bit more complicated to do that calculation. But the best I could do, if I want to have my volume be 15, well, I can't make, I could have something that was three by five. I could have a rectangle that was three units by five units. That would have a volume of 15. Or I could have a unit, something that was four by four with one corner taken out of it. Um, those actually both have a volume of 15 and their surface area is six, 16. So 15 times by 15 minus 15 is zero. So I've got the volume exactly right. But the smallest surface I can have for a volume of 15 is 16. I can't do better than that. 
And so the smallest surface would be 16 minus 13 is three squared is nine times three is 27. So no configuration of voxels can have an energy less than 27. And this is a case where the where the where the la the identity of the lattice does change your result. If I went to a hexagonal lattice, my surface area for the same volume would be bigger because I have two more nearest neighbors. And so the calculation of volume would not change, but the calculation of surface area would change. And my optimal shape would change when I went to a hexagonal lab. I didn't assign that one because it's a little more complicated to do it, but that's one you could do as a little exercise on just as a simulation exercise and see what happens. Any questions about this? Again, it takes a little bit, of, a lot of times we just take these things for granted, uh, but I think it's worth, at least doing a little bit of this by hand so that you get a sense of what kinds of problems you might run into so that if and when you run a simulation that does something you don't expect, you have an idea of where to look. Uh, almost every simulation method you will ever use uh, will sometimes not do what you expect. Sometimes that's because there's a bug in the simulation, but more often it's because it's doing what you asked it to do, but you didn't really understand what you were asking. And so this is the kind of thing that you run into. This can happen with center models too. They can have some funny things happen uh, when you define interaction uh, ranges uh, for uh, potentials, where you can have things cluster together and plump in ways you don't expect uh, in center models. So it's not unique to lattice models, but every every methodology has its own uh, little bits of um, unexpected complications. So we talked about dynamics. Again, our dynamics in reality is given by uh, cytoskeletal extension and retraction of membranes. Uh, in the body, there also are long range flows that are driven by uh, actin contraction leading to things like muscle contraction, large scale muscle contraction and actual fluid flow. Uh, at the cell level, these are usually quasi random unless you're a myofiber. And so uh, CompuCell caricatures that by saying that you have random fluctuations and drag so that forces are proportional to velocity. And the way it works, as we mentioned, is that you try randomly to move boundaries. You pick a lattice site. You say, if I copy my value in this lattice site to a neighboring lattice site, what happens to my effective energy? If it goes down, I always accept it. If it goes up, I normally reject it, but I have some probability of accepting it that's scaled by the energy cost divided by the fluctuation. And that has the property that my system on, uh, on average evolves to reduce the pattern energy. Now there was a question which is, <clears throat> one, why does the pattern energy seem to go up often rather than down? And two, uh, what's going on with things like entropy? And one of the things that we have to remember is that this system is driven. It's not at equilibrium. We are, our cells are moving actively. Another thing that we have to remember is that uh, we are used to thinking about statistical mechanics in the context of equilibrated systems, and we're not. And so the, the, that uh, we can have local movement of boundaries to reduce pattern energy, that does not mean that the pattern as a whole reduces its energy. And there's some technical, there's some technical um, paradoxes that, that would be, that 
are of interest to physicists and probably not to anybody else in the room. They're not, they're not to the biologists and not to, not to the, um, not to the computing people. But the key thing is that you're evaluating energy changes locally, one voxel at a time. And that means that an energy change that you make here could change what happens somewhere else, non-locally. Uh, and that, that uh, has, has a variety of consequences, both for the computational methodology and for the, what's possible in these systems. Uh, in particular, uh, physics has a, a rule that says that forces derived from a potential can have, by definition, not a zero curl, that they have zero circulation. They can't be rotational. Um, and that's not true for the forces that we define here. We can define potentials that give rise to cur uh, forces that give rise to rotation. And the reason for that is we're not solving it simultaneously everywhere. We're solving it locally at points one at a time. And if you're a real physicist and you want to know the penalty for that, because there's no free lunch, it's that the time sequence of events gets fuzzed out in this kind of model. If you see a boundary move in one place and a boundary move in another place, uh, if they're more than one Monte Carlo step apart, you can say this moved first and that moved second. But within a Monte Carlo step, you can't say what happened before something else. And so you lose time ordering. That's the cost of being able to do rotation with a potential. Yeah. So, so let me repeat that, because that was a very good point that Juliana made. If you're in biology and you're doing microscopy, you don't actually have completely continuous images. You may take an image, if you're lucky, every minute or every two minutes or every three minutes. You don't have the details of how you got from one image to the next. You don't know. You have to guess what happened. Uh, in principle, you could take images more frequently. In practice, it winds up that's often not possible. And so there is an uncertainty in how things get from one configuration to another in biology, given the data we have, uh, that is somewhat similar to what happens here. We know the initial state and the final state, uh, the details of exactly how boundaries move to get from one state to the other is a bit fuzzed out. Uh, and that's the cost of these stochastic methods. Computationally, they're absolutely stable, unconditionally stable, which is nice. Uh, and they let us do a lot of things that are very convenient, but there is a cost. There's no free lunch. Good point. Okay, other comments or questions before we continue? So let me... So, so constraint tries to minimize effective energy. There's a little bit complicated, so that I should probably be careful. I'm more careful about my terminology than I have been. Um, at any given instant, if I evaluate whether a particular boundary is going to move in a particular direction at any given instant, it is more likely to move in the direction that will reduce the effective energy than in the direction that will increase the effective energy. But that's a statement about local movement of a boundary at a single position at a single time. Globally, it winds up that a cell as a whole will tend to move in a way that satisfies its constraints to the extent that it can. So in other words, if I have a cell that is bigger than its target volume and everything else about that cell is satisfied, then the cell will tend to lose volume. But typically what will happen is you will reach a situation in which 
all of the constraints are partly satisfied and the energy cost associated with satisfying one constraint costs just as much in penalty from the other. If I am in a situation where my actual volume is less than my target and my surface area is greater than my target, adding a voxel will make the volume better and the surface area worse. And so there's a trade-off. And so I'm going to be just at that boundary uh, typically. If I have large scale uh, signals in my environment, for example, suppose I have a chemical gradient in my environment and my cell is chemotaxing, it will try to move towards the source of a chemical then the bulk movement of that cell will correspond to the effective energy it will effectively behave as if the cell's in a chemical potential. But locally, uh, you see this movement towards satisfying constraints, but that doesn't mean that globally the system moves towards satisfying constraints. You do see that a little bit in the simulation we did before. Uh, we, we started out with square cells in a square lattice. And we saw that the cells initially made became rounder. They lost that square symmetry from the beginning. And then the, la then the aggregate of cells much more slowly rounded up when we did the simulation last week. Uh, so in that case, you're seeing both a local relaxation and a global relaxation the time scale of the global relaxation being slower than the local one. And so, yes, the constraints are dynamic. You're always evaluating what happens if I move this particular boundary in this particular situation at this particular time. Moving the same boundary at a different time when the rest of the cell's configuration was different might have a different result. So I, I tend did not over want to overemphasize the physics of this because as physicists, we tend to be so used to equilibria and uh, deterministic movement that a lot of our instincts about how these things behave aren't quite right. But, but it's quite interesting to understand if, if one is, if that's, if that's something that's important. Okay, so we, we overran our time for our break. Why don't we take a five minute break and come back at 7.10 and we'll keep going on this discussion uh, at, at 7.10, okay? And I don't, I don't mean to, uh, JH, I don't mean to, uh, to dismiss your question. I think th these are quite profound questions um, and I'd be happy to talk about them offline as well. Um, and uh, when we developed this methodology 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago, uh, there was a lot of kickback from the physics community because uh, of exactly the issues that you're bringing up here. Um, and ultimately, the, the, ultimately the, the, the validation of this method is that the velocity of a cell as an entire object is proportional to the gradient of the force. I mean, the gradient of the potential energy is proportional to the force. The velocity is proportional to the force. Um, and, and that's what you want at macroscopically. At a macroscopic level, that's what you want. Microscopically, how you get that, um, the, the metropolis algorithm, which is what a version of which, a modified version of which is in the dynamics we use. The Mitropolis algorithm was developed to do equilibrium uh, thermodynamics. And it wasn't ever intended to do, uh, to, to, do, to do dynamics of the kind that we're doing here. And so in a sense, it's an accident that it works. Um, and it only works if things move relatively slowly. If, if things move very rapidly, if you push things too hard, it breaks. And so you'll see the simulations will break if you apply forces that are too large. So 
something that we mentioned before was that if we just have a volume constraint, uh, that doesn't um, force you to have a cell voxels that are connected. You can have any voxel, the voxels can be anywhere in your cell lattice, as long as you have the right number of them. And so the, the assignment was to create a volume constraint with target volume for 75. And then something that uh, we, we mentioned quickly, but we didn't go over in detail was uh, how to create an initial single cell. And one way to do that is in Python. And we may come back to that at the end of the class today if we have time. Um, the other way to do it is to use the initializers that we have initializers that we have, the default one that's enabled is a uniform initializer. A uniform initializer draws a rectangle or a parallel pipette of cells uh, defined by a box min and a box max, the two corners. And then you have uh, a width which says we're going to draw square cells and how big those cells are in voxels a list of the cell types we're going to fill in, and we can say to give a gap, but a little, make, leave a little space between the cells, which is called gap. And if the, if the size of the cells doesn't line up exactly with the uh, periodicity of the lattice, then, then you can have some cells that are cut off or, or overrun a little bit. A uh, blob initializer draws a rough circle of cells. And for blob initializer, instead of specifying the corners of a rectangle, you specify the center of a circle and the radius of a circle. And again, you specify the size of the cell as a square. And if you want to have space between your cells, space. And one way to create a single cell is just to say that the radius of the circle you're drawing is smaller than the width of the cell divided by two. It's not very elegant, but it works. Something to notice with steppables, uh, especially initializer steppables, is they have things called regions. You'll see steppable type blob initializer region and region. So I can define multiple regions. If I want to define five different circles in different places, I can do that. And uh, so that's convenient. Uh, the other thing is that these are actually executed sequentially. And so if I have uh, an initializer specified that writes to the same region of the lattice as the previous initializer, the later one will overwrite the earlier one. So if I did say blob initializer at the same center point and the same radius, and I said mesenchymal cell only, and then I had another region which was the same center point and radius that was epithelial only, I would get epithelial cells only because the second one will overwrite the first one. So if you have one that's in your simulation, uh, it's important to remember to get rid of it before you to, to make sure that the other ones work the way you want them. Uh, but it does mean that it won't crash, that overriding things can actually be useful. If I want to write, make concentric circles uh, to make a, a ring or something, that, that works actually pretty well. So, uh, we should have fancier initializers that let you draw better initial conditions. So if anybody wanted to write one of those as a class project, that would be fine. <laughs> okay. So the homework problem was to create a single cell with only a volume constraint. And if you do that, what you find is that the cell breaks apart because there's nothing in the simulation that tells the voxels to stay connected to each other. The voxels will wander off and they'll get dust. Okay. 
Now, if I have a volume and a surface constraint, how was it different? Does anybody want to chime in and tell us how what they got for this uh, 3.2 here? What did they see? I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing a great uh, groundswell. Maybe am I muted? Am I am I talking to nobody? Well, People can hear, hear me online, right? Yeah. And you. Okay. Never know with Zoom. Okay. Does anybody want to say something? When you have a high target volume and a, and a low target surface. What happens? That's the second question. High target volume, low target surface. What happens? Uh, I could go again. Sure, yeah. please. Uh, I, I just found that, or at least what I found was that the morphology of the cell was really, was kind of spherical, but it was just fixed in place, at least in my simulations. And it, and it just like did not move and it was just kind of pinned. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I waited. I at least that it stayed that way for two hundred time, time steps, a thousand time steps, just kind of chilled there. Yeah, that's that's about right. This would correspond to an example of something like a basketball, where the cell is under very high pressure because the 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 target volume would like the the target volume means that the cell vo the cell that the volume energy would decrease if the actual volume increased, but that would increase the surface, which is a panel, which is panelized. And so the result is that the cell is effectively under very strong compression. And that will make it rigid. Basically, it'll behave like a golf ball or, or a basketball. And it won't move by itself, it won't move. Okay, somebody else who hasn't answered a question before, I may call on somebody. Nick, if you have low target volume and high target surface, what happens? Okay, low target volume, high target surface. Let me look at that. Right. Low volume, oh, for this one, mine kind of disintegrated into mm -hmm. a ton of teeny little blobs. Yeah. That's right. It's, you're back to your dust case. The, the highest surface area I could have would be for each voxel to be completely separated from every other voxel. The, the lowest volume, the lowest surface I could have for a given volume is when all my voxels are together in a single clump that's more or less rectangular or circular. The highest I can have is if every voxel is completely separated in space. So those are the two limits. One of them basically is a gas, and one of them is a solid. And so uh, between the two of you, you're seeing the two sort of pathological limiting cases. If you make the surface area, the target surface too big, the cell breaks up into lots of little droplets. If you make the target surface too small, the cell gets compressed and freezes. And normally, unless we're simulating plants or simulating the dispersal of a cell after it dies and the membrane disappears, uh, we don't want either of those cases. Normally, what we want is for the target volume and the target surface to be proportional to each other so that the cell stays compact but is still able to move. And so one of the critical things is defining for a given volume, what surface we need for that to be reasonable. And one way we could do that is in, in, in Euclidean space, we could say, if the target surface is less than the surface area of a sphere, we know this thing has to be under compression because that's the most, that's the smallest surface we can have for a given volume. In our case, the actual surface will be bigger than that. Uh, similarly, we could say for our dust, 
what is the surface for a given volume for dust, and we need it to be much smaller than that. So that gives us a sense of the range of volumes of, of surfaces we can have for a given target volume. And so these are examples. If we change the lambdas, lambda volume and lambda surface, we also get things that are interesting. If lambda volume is very big compared to lambda surface, then our constraints will tend to satisfy the volume constraint and not the surface constraint. So if lambda volume is much bigger than lambda surface, the cells have about the right target volume, but the surface will be much off of its target. Similarly, if we make lambda surface much, much bigger than lambda volume, the surface will be about right, but the volume will be off. If target volume is big compared to target surface, cells get floppy or break apart. If target volume is much less than target surface, the cells get stiff and compact. And when I say round, it may actually be more square because of the lattice. And so that comes back to these pictures that we, these movies that we showed last time at the beginning during the class, where we looked at different situations and asked the question, which of these were biologically more meaningful or reasonable? And to some extent, this is really a question about the biology, because sometimes cells crawl in a very orderly way. Sometimes they really do reach out pretty far and then retract. And so that second picture on the right of the cell breaking apart, uh, if I squinted, could actually be a cell that's crawling very, very rapidly. Uh, similarly, for the reorganization of a tissue, um, the one in the mid, the third one over, so cell sorting where all the cells are behaving in about the same way, on the right, the blue cells are having membranes that are merging into each other and the green cells are behaving as if they're stiff and under tension under pressure um, if i was dealing with a plant then the cell walls are pretty stiff um, there are situations in which the cell membranes get very interdigitated and floppy so um, i have to ask the question that i want cells typically to stay connected and at least not have a lot of stray pixels boundaries should be fluid, but not completely crumpled. We don't want them lining up with the lattice direction. Um, on the other hand, there are cases in biology when those things happen. So it's possible that that's what you want, but typically you're gonna to wanna to stay away. If I have a situation in which the fluctuation amplitude of my system is too small compared to the effective energy, the cells won't move, and I'll get cell walls lining up with the lattice directions, and I'll see faceting. I'll see square or octagonal cells. If the fluctuations are too big compared to the effective energy, the cells will split up. They'll see lots of stray voxels and you'll see the disappearance or crumpling of cell boundaries. And so those are pathologies that you'll run into. And when you see those pathologies, it's useful to have an idea of how to fix them. What are the things that could be causing them? Okay. So we have a bit of a choice here. We can either go back to the last class and do some more exercises with cells and cell membrane adhesion, or I can show you a little bit about how to uh, plot graphs in CompuCell. And I don't know, we have half an hour, so I don't know which of those two things would be more interesting to people. If people feel that exploring the, the cell membrane, cell, cell interactions is still interesting, we can definitely spend our last time doing that. If people would rather learn how to plot things, I'm happy to do that too. How about a thumbs up for people who would like to do plots? 
Okay. Two, online, three, four, five. Okay, people want plots, all right. So, ah, well, shoot, I forgot something. So uh, maybe we won't get the plots today, actually. I forgot one thing that's actually pretty important that I do need to do, my apologies. So coming, before we get to plots, I want to talk about contact energies. Um, I showed this slide rather quickly. And this, to some extent, is a recapitulation of the calculation we just did calculating surface areas. Uh, but I want to go over this with you because it's, again, something which is very physics-y in the way it's written, uh, but fundamentally represents a simple biological concept, which is if I have two cells and I bring them in contact with each other, they will have some contact energy per unit area. They'll either stick together or they'll repel each other. And so uh, if I assume that the cells are uniform over their surface, which they're really not, but we'll assume that for the moment, then I can define a contact energy per unit area that depends on what kind of cell I have on either side of the contact. In reality, I probably want to say that this cell has a certain number of coherence and so on and write the energy that way. And I can, we'll show you how to do that later in the class. But to begin with, we'll assume all of our cells of type A are the same as our cells of type A, all B or D. So the energy per unit area is a function only of the cell types. And again, we have to remember that larger energies are less adhesive. And so let's actually think about that for a second. And I did a little example for us. So what we're going to do, if we want to do the equivalent of this, the calculation we did just before, is we're going to go over each voxel in a cell. For each voxel, we find all voxels within the specified interaction range. If the second voxel belongs to the same cell, we ignore it. If it belongs to a different cell, we ask, what is the type of our cell and what is the type of the neighbor cell? And add the J value that corresponds to the energy per unit contact area between those two types of cells. So here I've drawn a little picture where I have eight cells, these parts of eight cells. And I suppose there are four types, A, B, C, and D. And so I'm going to pick a voxel. Here I picked one in cell three. I find its nearest neighbors. I'll assume I'm nearest neighbor. There are four nearest neighbors. Two of those are in cell three, two are in cell six. So I ignore cell three. Cell three is of type A, cell six is of type C. So I have two units of JAC. So my contact energy here is two times JAC for that voxel. And I have to repeat that over and over and over again. And you'll notice that everything gets double counted. Everything will get double counted because I'll be looking from three to six, and I'll look from six to three as well. There's one exception to that, which is medium does not double count. And so uh, the energy, contact energy for medium is actually half of what you think it is because of that. That's a little bit of a trap that's built into this. Okay, then I pick another voxel here, three there. Its neighbors are three, 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 and five. So the only one that matters is three to five. Three is of type A, five is of type B, so I get one energy J, A, B. Okay. Elmer, that looks confused. You look puzzled. I haven't shown medium here, so I, I'm not doing that. 
The, the only question is about double counting. And, and uh, uh, we can come back to that another time. Uh, if we were doing second neighbor interactions, then I have to draw my second neighbors. And so that same voxel from before now has one, two, three, four threes as neighbors, three sixes as neighbors, and a five as a neighbor. And so now the energy from that is three AC plus JAB. Three JAC plus JAB. So when I go to longer interaction ranges, I'm always going to get a bigger contact energy for the same configuration. Actually, I should be a little bit careful because there's no rule that says that the J's have to be positive. They can be negative as well as positive. Bigger J is less adhesive, smaller J is more adhesive. So let's think about that together for a minute. Suppose that I pick this green voxel that's number that's the white two. Um, and I, I had a little bit of an exercise. I don't want to spend too much time on it here, uh, but let's just think about one or two of these. If I look at that two, what are its nearest neighbors? Somebody? Four, three, two, and two. So I have one J, two, four, two is type C, four is type A, so I have one J A C, two is type C, three is type A, so I also have J A C, so I have two J A C. Okay. If I go to second neighbor, I bring in also this one that's on the diagonal. If I look at my three here, this three nearest neighbors next to three, three, five, and five. If I add second neighbors, it adds a four. And so not only the length of the boundary goes up as I go to longer interaction ranges, but potentially I'm interacting with more different cells. And if I went to a very long interaction range, like four or five, and my cell were very small, I could actually interact with a cell that I don't touch directly as a nearest neighbor thing at all. Suppose I had a thin strip of a cell, my interaction could jump over that cell and touch the neighboring cell. Now that in some ways feels very artificial, but if the cell boundaries are fluctuating a lot in reality. For example, the cell is sending out philopodia and exploring its environment, but I'm not able to see that on the time scale or the length scale I'm making my measurements. Then it really is possible for the cells to be exploring space not very far away from their surfaces, their obvious surfaces, but at least a little bit away. And so having some degree of non local interaction actually is not unrealistic biologically in many cases. But again, you have to ask the question, in your particular biological case, is that realistic or not? Elmer, yes. So, so Elmer points out that one problem which was noted in the 19th century novel Flatland uh, is that in 2D, you can't have things reach around other things. And so in particular, there, there, you can't have two interconnected networks that penetrate space. 
in two dimensions. In 3D, I could have veins and arteries that are both connected and both fill space, and they move through the gaps between each other. In 2D, I can't do that. I can only have one connected network, one connected tree. And so the ability for things to touch each other is much greater in 3D than in 2D. And so uh, that, that potentially means that 3D simulations actually, while they're slower, they're a little bit softer and a little bit better behaved than 2D simulations. Freezing on the lattice and a lot of the uh, hitting effects that you get in 2D are less severe in 3D. But they do run a lot slower because the simulation time is proportional to the number of voxels. And clearly, a 100 by 100 by 100 lattice has 100 times more voxels than a 100 by 100 lattice. So there's a cost to that. That's a good point. OK. So one thing that we're going to face is it would be nice if CompuCell would automatically rescale our J values when we change the interaction rate. The problem is that if we do this calculation in detail, and we're not going to have time to do it today, and I'm not going to assign it as a homework problem, it was, would have been a homework problem, uh, is that the way those scalings work depends on the size and shape of the cells. And so there is no universal way to say, you go from nearest neighbor to second neighbor and divide your J's by two. You actually have to, you can approximate what would happen. Because if I go from nearest neighbor to second neighbor in a square lattice, nearest neighbor has four, second neighbor has eight. So I'd expect to divide J by two to keep things the same. And it's not way off, but it's not going to be perfect because it's going to depend on the geometric details of the system. And because it's not exact, we decided it was safer to have pe warn people that this happens and have them do it themselves rather than build in a, a correction that's not always correct. Uh, maybe that was a mistake, but that's, uh, that's how it works. Okay. And so uh, one of the things that comes up uh, is that uh, scaling on what we call Manhattan map Manhattan metric, that is on a lattice, distances. Um, if I have in Euclidean space, if I have a square of side length L, its area goes like L squared, its perimeter goes like 4L. If I have a circle, its area goes like pi over 4 D squared, its perimeter goes like pi D. Similarly for cubes. And if I look at the ratio of the area, the square root of the area to the perimeter, or the cube root of the volume to the square root of the area, those are numbers that are a function of shape only and don't change as I change the radius. On a lattice, that isn't true. In particular, uh, the, the rules that we've defined for a lattice uh, give us uh, a lot more surface per volume for small things than we would expect. So let's just uh, let's just imagine we have. Well, I'm I'm not going to make us do this exercise. You can play with this. Uh, but you'll find that the way the surface to volume ratio scales on a lattice is not what you get in Euclidean space. When the object gets big compared to the lattice size, it works. But for small objects, the scaling is not what you expect. The surface areas are bigger than you would expect. And so that's something you have to be aware of. If you take your simulation and you make all of your cells 100 lattice constants, 100 voxels, 
And then you rerun the simulation where you rescaled them to make them 10 voxels. The parameter values have to be adjusted uh, because of that scale. Okay. As a reminder, uh, the contact energies are defined in a plugin called contact. And for each pair of cell types, we define a contact energy. And the default value is 10, all the same. And that doesn't do anything very interesting. And there's also a neighbor order. Uh, this is telling us to use fourth, neighbor, fourth order neighbors. We now know what that means. I haven't gone through it in some detail. Um, one of the things that we showed it when we ran CompuCell before, and we didn't really have a chance today to do much of that, uh, is that you could change those values as the simulation runs if you want to see what happens. You don't have to stop the simulation, edit the code, then run it again. Uh, one thing to remember is that if you define a parameter as a floating point initially, when you type in a new value, it has to have a period, it has to have a floating point. It has to be dot some 10 dot, not 10. If you start it as an integer, it has to stay an integer. And as I mentioned, I encourage you to look up the adhesion flex plugin, which gives you a little bit more. Uh, flexibility for doing cell dependent uh, contact editors. And we did some playing around with different contact energies and surface energies to make cells coalesce, to separate, uh, to make the cell clusters rounded, uh, to make the cells individually round. All right, so let me just, I'm going to skip these extra exercises. I want to talk a little bit about cell shape. Cells have a huge diversity of shapes in reality. Compucell lets us define cell shape more than a center model would where the cell is just a point. Uh, but it's still not ideal for defining things that have very, very complex shapes. If I have a neuron, which is a Purkinje cell, which has thousands of branches, and I wanted to represent that in CompuCell, I need to make the individual cells have volumes of tens of thousands of voxels. I could do that, but I'd be stuck for representing one or two cells. On the other hand, I do have the ability to make cells that have some basic uh, shapes. I could make them round, more or less symmetrical. I can make them a, a little bit elongated. And I can, uh, by using cellular compartments, which we'll talk about later in the class, although you can also uh, look up if you want to read ahead, I can make cells have epithelial behavior, that is cells where the lateral surface of the top and the bottom surface are not the same. So that the various surface components of the cell have different properties. Uh, and I can also do things like I can string uh, subcells together in a line, like beads on a string, to make something that behaves more like, say, a bacterium or a sperm cell. So I have the ability to build, if I think about uh, a CompuCell generalized cell, not as a cell per se, but as a little volume of material, I can assemble those volumes of materials into cells with more complex shapes. And so if the flexibility of what I could do with a single blob isn't enough, I can build cells out of multiple blobs to define more complex shapes. And people do this with center models too, what's called the subcellular element method, where you take uh, multiple uh, center model cells and assemble them into essentially molecules with particular shapes. And so it's possible to do that as well. 
And so I think it's worth it's worth thinking about uh, what we could do um, in terms of defining how uh, smooth or rough the boundaries of cells are. And in reality, we'll see some cells where the boundaries are in fact very uh, interdigitated. If I look in that middle picture there, uh, of uh, which is labeled chick limbod mesenchyme. I'll see that the boundaries of my cells really are pretty corrugated. They're pretty, they're pretty fuzzy, and there are components of the cell that are pretty far away from the cell main part of the cell. And so representing that uh, with the CompuCell model where the cell has a lot of surface compared to volume, so that the cells are floppy and uh, uh, inter and, and, and uh, fluctuating is probably not a bad thing. Uh, in the example below where I have the human fibroblasts, they're more compact. And so that'd be more like the picture on the top. In epithelia, typically, at least if I look from the top, the cells look pretty compact. And so that again would be more like the picture from the top. And so the degree to which I want my cells to fluctuate uh, is going to depend on the biology. My cells by default are isotropic, they're essentially round. That doesn't mean that they fluctuate, they're not that at any given instant they're round, but they don't prefer to be elongated in any particular direction. Uh, CompuCell does have an option called a length constraint, which says that I want my cell to be an, essentially an oval rather than a circle. And if I click on that length constraint, I have the option of defining something that says the cell should be elongated. But what I'll find when I do that, um, sorry. What I find when I do that is that there's a limit to how much I can elongate a cell. If I pull on the cell too much and I say I want the cell to be two by one, essentially an oval like this, that will work. If I sell, I say I want the cell to have an aspect ratio of 10, the cell will do what I asked it to do, but it will cheat. The cell will split into two compartments and move them apart like a dumbbell. Uh, it has the desired volume. It has the desired surface area and it's got the desired aspect ratio because I didn't say that the cell had to stay connected. And so there's a tick box there uh, called connectivity constraint that you can tick that forces the cell to stay connected even if you elongate it. Uh, the downside of that is it slows your simulation down a lot. A better way to do that if you really want elongated cells is to build them out of cellular components. That's a better bet. Yeah. So CompuCell does not have an intrinsic concept of cell polarity. Uh, we will show you how to, you can easily add a vector to a CompuCell cell that defines a polarity. That works. Uh, when you build compartmental cells, those allow you to define polarization very easily. But typically what you'll do is you'll say the cell has a apical compartment, a basal compartment, and a, basal, and a lateral compartment. And you give the, those three compartments different properties and then that defines the polarity of the cell. But you don't have a concept which is equivalent to the one in, uh, I think, physicists, cell, at least in many, many center models like Dirks, where you say the cell has an intrinsic polarization and it's Energy depends on the angle with respect to the polarization. I define so 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 my cell at the moment, all voxels inside my cell are the same. I could say that my cell is composed of sub cell sub compartments A, B, and C, each one of which have different properties. 
And I've, I've shown you simulations that use that quite a bit, but I, we didn't go into the details here. Um, if I have a cell that crawls uh, in three dimensions, I might define a nuclear compartment that stays rather round and rigid, a cytoplasmic compartment that's sloppy, and a labellopodium compartment that likes to stick to my substrate and extend. And that'll give me a crawling cell that looks a lot like a, like a, a, a fibroblast. Uh, if I want to simulate an epithelial cell in three dimensions, I can define the top surface of the cell that says it doesn't want to stick to anything. Bottom surface of the bottom box compartment of the cell that says it wants to stick to extracellular matrix and not to other cells. Lateral surfaces of the cell that say they want to stick to other cells and not to medium or to the extracellular matrix. And that'll give rise to a sheet like structure. So those th that's definitely possible to do. So we can show you how to do that. If you want to build a, a 3D model of organized culture, you're going to need to do that. So for example, if I wanted to find uh, tubes in 3D that are self-maintaining, I have to define the top and the bottom surfaces of the cells being different, the lateral surfaces being different. If I want to define cysts, to do the same thing. Uh, it's a very flexible thing to do. It's also a little bit cumbersome, which is why I don't do it right away at the beginning. Because you have a lot more things to keep track of in terms of how many, how you have to specify how each piece of the cell interacts within the cell and outside the cell. So it's more things to keep track of. At one. Well, Okay, I'm sorry, we ran out of time before we got to talk about, about um, Python model specification. So next week we will dig into Python and how to specify models and how to do plots uh, and analysis inside of CompuCell. And I appreciate everybody's patience. I appreciate you being willing to, to work on the uh, project ideas together on, uh, in real time. I hope that that was helpful. Again, there'll be no new homework assignment. If you are behind on homework, please hand in what you have when you can do it. Uh, but try to meet with potential partners, use the discussion documents, the Slack, talk to us. And uh, again, if you have a project idea you're ready to present next week, that would be great. If people are not ready for it, don't push yourself too hard. Uh, I'd rather people take the time to develop their ideas uh, than to feel that they're under too much pressure. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, is there a question before we break? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good night.